and uh, one of the best lectures of this plenary session, first plenary session, is about aging. So sure, we have a symposium about aging uh, dedicated to Professor Yoshikawa, but here we have a different perspective. So, you know, you know how we can extend the life of human being. Now, is it sustainable or not sustainable? That's a different story. And the way I can I can make the case that it is sustainable, but uh, and this follows in our Flogan sustainability framework. But you know, aging is a sickness or a disease, and how this can be managed. And here we are with a very interesting presentation on the subject from uh, Professor Tavenarakis. Uh, he is a vice uh, president of European Research Council. Please. Thank you, Florian. Thank you. So why would you, would, uh, should we care about aging and uh, the links of aging with diseases such as uh, neurodegeneration? I think we all know and appreciate these days that the human population is aging. Actually, data from some countries like Sweden and Japan, where we have full records, indicate that the uh, uh, segment of the population above 85 years of age is the fastest growing segment of the human population. We are now here beyond exponential. And if we consider the, the whole uh, human population, uh, the mean lifespan is increasing, actually, steadily over the past uh, decades. There was, of course, a turning point when we uh, came up with uh, uh, antibiotics and the advent of other pharmaceuticals that really incre increased uh, our survival chances uh, when infected, for example, with pathogen bacteria or viruses. Uh, but uh, in the last uh, few decades, we've actually witnessed a, a, a steady state of growth, of increase of uh, the mean lifespan uh, in humans. And in some uh, Western societies, this is actually now becoming a problem. Because as you've seen already this morning, uh, we used to have this, this nice uh, age pyramid. Uh, this indicates the distribution of ages across uh, uh, the population, male and uh, female. This was the case in 1950 for the whole human population. This was the case in 2010, and according to UN, this is going to be the case in uh, 2050. So we're not talking about a pyramid anymore, rather like a barrel. And of course, now that the human population is aging, we have to face other problems, and those problems are related to uh, diseases that are associated with aging. And actually, these diseases are becoming now the most common cause of uh, disability and death in Western societies. So we have neuro neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, cancer, stroke. These are just some examples of uh, pathological conditions associated with aging. Now, what can we do about it? Of course, we can always treat the symptom, and in this case, the symptom is the individual disease. For example, we can uh, treat uh, cancer. Let's say that we find a miracle cure, cure for cancer today. How much more would we expect to increase our, life, uh, uh, our lifespan if we did that? Uh, if we are at, uh, above 50, uh, you can expect uh, about 30, 35 years of uh, 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 additional life, so about uh, 85, which is not far away from the mean lifespan that we enjoy these days. Same thing with uh, curing heart disease completely or finding a miracle cure for both cancer and heart disease or curing metabolic diseases as well. We gain an incremental increase. But what we could, for some, uh, 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 in some way, uh, find a way to uh, unlink these pathological conditions from the aging process itself, then how would uh, how much more we would, uh, would we expect to um, increase human lifespan? You see that in this case, we actually have more of a quantum leap in this uh, increase. But if we are going to tackle aging, we need to consider what aging actually is. And in this case, we need to think about uh, uh, what are the molecular uh, underpinnings of aging? What's the molecular basis of aging? Now, uh, in biological systems, uh, aging comes about by the accumulation of damage. Biological systems, when functioning, even under physiological conditions, will accumulate damage. 
And there are, of course, intrinsic and extrinsic reasons to do to, for this. Intrinsic reasons have to do with metabolism itself and the byproducts of metabolism that are generated, such as reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress that ensues. Uh, external uh, factors are, for example, UV radiation, uh, uh, toxins, etc., from the environment, general stress coming from the environment. So this is causing stochastic molecular damage. We have damage in our proteins, damage in DNA, damage in lipids. Uh, the constituents of cells uh, are becoming damaged. And this is a cumulative effect. It uh, uh, evolves over time. And that's why eventually we will reach a, thers a certain threshold where the accumulation of such uh, uh, events, damage events, will result in the dysfunction of cells. Cells will not be able to function anymore. Tissues will not be able to function anymore. And of course, the organism will uh, uh, lose its homeostasis. And this is manifested in the end as disability, uh, disease, uh, pathology. This is the molecular definition of aging. So how would, would we then intervene in this case? Uh, one way to think about it is how certain cells actually do it. And if you think about it, Neuronal cells in our bodies are among the most long-lived cells that we have. Some of these cells were born even before we were born, and we literally die after our death. So despite them being fragile biological systems, they will actually survive for decades or even more than 100 years in some cases if we are lucky. So how do these neurons actually do it? As you know, neurons are not really uh, replenishing themselves during human life. Very few uh, uh, cases where neurogenesis uh, can happen in the adult. Uh, so most of these neurons will actually have to survive for the duration of human life. In order to do that, these cells will need to possess very elaborate homeostatic systems, systems that detoxify them from uh, the uh, byproducts of metabolism, from the toxic byproducts of metabolism, but also repair uh, the damage that's been caused. And these neurons have ways to do that, and they rely on energy to do it. They need energy in order to function. And actually, uh, neuronal cells are highly energy demanding cells. They are the most energy demanding cells in our bodies. That's why most of the food that we eat actually gets burned out by our brain. Uh, and they need that because uh, just for them to, to, to do their job and uh, uh, transmit, relay energy uh, uh, signals, electrical impulses, they will need to keep their membrane polarized. Now this is causing uh, a lot of uh, energy demand. And even just them sitting there doing nothing, they still consume a lot of energy to uh, just simply maintain their uh, 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 polarized uh, membrane. So they rely on specific organelles, subcellular organelles, to provide uh, them with this energy. Those organelles are mitochondria. Mitochondria are the organelles in the cell that produce uh, the energy currency of the cell, the ATP that is consumed by these uh, neurons. Now, uh, these organelles are very important, as you can imagine, particularly for neurons. And whenever there's something uh, going wrong with uh, mitochondria, then we have neuronal pathology. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, which is a very common, very well-known uh, neurodegenerative disorder disease, and it has become common because of the increase in our life expectancy. In the old days, you wouldn't get old enough to actually suffer uh, from Alzheimer's, but these days it's becoming more and more common. And one feature of, the, of Alzheimer's disease is exactly the accumulation of damaged mitochondria in neurons. This is one of the most prominent uh, hallmarks of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, uh, of course, uh, one of the things that uh, 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 discriminates age-related diseases is exactly this accumulation of, of uh, damaged mitochondria. Uh, it's the, do the common denominator of many pathologies associated with aging, uh, not just uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, for example, uh, uh, Huntington's, MS, etc., but also other diseases associated with aging, diabetes, obesity, cancer, lupus, uh, uh, other uh, autoimmune diseases. All uh, these uh, disorders have as a common denominator the accumulation of damaged mitochondria in our cells. 
Now, in addition uh, to uh, mitochondria accumulating in the context of pathology, we also have this phenomenon occurring uh, during normal aging itself. So it is also one of the hallmarks of the aging process itself. And in this case, we can quantify, for example, the number of mitochondria in tissues of uh, experimental animals that we use in the lab. The rat in this case, you can compare six months of uh, uh, versus 24 months of age rats. We can count mitochondria using electron microscopy. Or in simple organisms such as uh, Synorhabditis elegans, that's a popular organism for studying aging, and I will tell you a little bit more uh, later about it. We can even in vivo monitor uh, the progression of this accumulation by using fluorescent proteins. We express them specifically in mitochondria, and that way we can uh, follow the number of mitochondria in vivo without having to sacrifice these animals uh, to do electron microscopy. Now, why is it important to actually understand uh, how this uh, accumulation is happening? Uh, mitochondria, of course, produce ATP, as I said, but they also produce reactive oxygen species. This is one of the byproducts of metabolism. And uh, reactive oxygen species can cause a lot of damage. Actually, about, it has been calculated that about 0.1 to 2% of the oxygen that we consume will become reactive ox oxygen species in mitochondria. This is normal. It's something that is happening. Uh, any, any factory can produce waste and byproducts, and mitochondria, being the energy factory of the cell, also produce their own uh, byproducts, ROS. And of course, mitochondria themselves are the most prominent, uh, pro proximal targets of, 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 of ROS. Why are they, they the most proximal target? It's because ROS is generated there, so causing damage in situ is uh, uh, far more efficient in this case. So the mitochondria themselves become damaged by reactive oxygen species. They sustain most of the damage in the cell, and this is causing an aging phenomenon in mitochondria. So uh, young, fresh, uh, and uh, efficiently working mitochondria will produce a lot of ATP and very little ROS. But later on, we have this positive feedback. Damage uh, in mitochondria is causing them to now produce less uh, ATP and more reactive oxygen species. So we have this spiraling down of mitochondrial function. Uh, eventually, mitochondria end up producing very little ATP and a lot of reactive oxygen species. So it is uh, to the interest of cells to actually maintain a healthy pool of mitochondria. And if you think about it, there are two processes in the cell that will um, uh, balance uh, the number and the function of mitochondria. On one hand, we have mitochondrial biogenesis. It's the process that creates mitochondria. On the other hand, we have mitochondrial degradation, uh, the turnover of damaged mitochondria. Now, in healthy young cells, these two processes are balanced. Uh, of course, there are uh, uh, means to uh, fine-tune or adjust this uh, number of mitochondria based on physiological demands in cells. So there will uh, be some adjustment, but eventually uh, a balance will be restored. Uh, however, during aging and in the context of aging-associated pathologies, as I've shown you, we have a collapse of this homeostasis, and instead we end up with runaway accumulation of mitochondria. So this is what we would like to understand. What is the mechanism that brings about this uh, collapse of homeostasis. And in order to do that, of course, we cannot uh, study uh, this phenomena directly in humans for obvious reasons, but we can resort to uh, experimental animals that provide us with the appropriate fe features that uh, are, are uh, suitable to, to carry out this, this kind of research. And one such uh, feature is Synorhabditis elegans. It's a simple nematode worm. And why am I mentioning it here? I think it demonstrates the value of basic research that uh, provides answers to uh, questions that also are highly relevant uh, to humans. So these animals are very simple. I've shown you already in the previous slide uh, that uh, they have a very short lifespan. This is important if you're doing aging studies. You don't want to, to wait for your experimental organism to die for years and years because PhD students would not be able to complete their PhDs and uh, do a meaningful experiment. On the other hand, you also need to be able to create, and this is very important, 
uh, isogenically identical populations. Why is this important? If we are to isolate the contribution of a single gene in the aging process, we would need to have identical populations to compare. Aging is a population phenomenon. It's defined at the level of the population, not the individual. So we would need to establish large populations of identical individuals only differing in one genetic locus. That way we would uh, be able to uh, pinpoint, to de determine the contribution of this uh, gene uh, to, the, to the aging process. So C. elegans allows us to do that. This is something that it cannot be possibly done with humans and cannot be possibly done with uh, genetically uh, sexually reproducing uh, animals, such as, for ex example, mice or even Drosophila, which is another um, popular uh, model organism. But in C. elegans, we can easily do this because these animals are hermaphrodites, so they essentially produce clones of themselves, and this is easy to do. Now, in addition, uh, this animal offers another set of unique advantages, one of them being that uh, in, in this case, we have the whole uh, developmental plan of the worm uh, known. So we know exactly how these animals are made, right from the zygote, the fertilized oocyte, down to the adult uh, that only contains 959 cells. So we know the genealogy of each and every cell in C. elegans. So we know the full developmental plan. We know how many of these cells are muscles, neurons, etc. And this uh, is very easy to follow. Actually, these animals are transparent. And you can see we can uh, locate all cellular divisions during development. This is the genealogy tree of each and every cell in, in the worm. You see most of the, of the cellular divisions are happening during embryogenesis in the egg. Then we have some more cellular divisions uh, up until the adult. So it provides an anatomical description that is unparalleled in the uh, arsenal of experimental organisms. And when it comes to studying neurodegeneration, which is the topic of today's uh, presentation, and uh, aging, actually C. elegans offers another unique feature. We, are, we, we know exactly how the nervous system of this simple animal uh, is constructed. About 302 neurons, making about 600 synapses, uh, 6,000 6, synapses total. And we don't just know how many neurons we have or how many synapses we have. We also know how these neurons are connected to each other. So we have the full circuitry of a nervous system. This is actually the first animal for which we have a full connectome of a nervous system. And we are far away from uh, the next animal, Drosophila melanogaster. And of course, mammals are out of the question uh, for the time being. And this allows us to even follow how signals are perceived by a nervous system, processed, and then output it to uh, motor neurons to generate behavior. It's the only animal where we can uh, have such detailed uh, analysis. Now, you might ask, OK, if we use C. elegans to study neurodegeneration, to study aging, how relevant would that be to humans? And indeed it is, I'm going to demonstrate in a, in a while uh, uh, what we came up with C. elegans, which is also valid in humans. But suffice it to say for this time uh, that uh, because we have evolved from a single uh, uh, cell uh, billions of years ago, the last universal common ancestor, actually we share unique biology. All organisms in, in, uh, in uh, on Earth share unique bi uh, common biology. And this is exemplified by the similarities that are seen between, for example, genes and proteins. And some of these proteins, that are, which are the functional blocks of cells, can even be interchanged between different organisms. So for example, we can take a human protein, put it in C. elegans, and it will work, and vice versa. We can take an, an nematode protein, put it in a human cell, and it will replace the human protein. So there is a lot of homology, as we say, between uh, proteins and uh, functional constituents uh, of cells uh, of various organisms. I'm showing you here a comparison between yeast, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the fly, and Cynorhabditis elegans, the worm, humans as well. You see how common uh, the proteome is with respect to one category of proteins called kinases. And this is just one example. Uh, so indeed, uh, we can rely on these simple models to address, to tackle uh, complex questions that are highly relevant uh, to human pathology as well. 
And we've already learned a lot by studying aging in such simple organisms. For example, we, we know now that aging is regulated by insulin IGF-1 signaling. We know that it's uh, also uh, modulated by dietary restriction, by mitochondrial function, by the reproductive system, metabolism, biological rhythm, uh, regulating genes, the environment, of course, as well as genetic and epigenetic factors, other genetic and epigenetic factors uh, in general. And not only did we learn, we can actually now apply this knowledge to influence aging, to manipulate aging. So it's not uh, some sort of uh, science fiction to say that we can now alter lifespan in model organisms. We can change the lifespan of, of modern organisms ranging, for example, from C. elegans up to primates, which is as close as we can get to humans. So this is just one example. These are survival curves just to show you how, how much we can influence, we can perturb lifespan in C. elegans based on what we've learned. So this is not all theoretical knowledge. We can actually go now and intervene into the biological system and change its, uh, uh, its lifespan. So this is the curve for uh, wild type animals, the black dots here. What happens, let's say, if we activate, uh, we uh, influence uh, uh, insulin signaling. Uh, we actually downregulate insulin signaling. We extend lifespan. Uh, now, these survival curves can be used to derive two uh, uh, meaningful values. One is, of course, the maximum lifespan. Maximum lifespan is defined as uh, the interval, the time interval it takes for the last, the, long, the most long-lived individual in the population to die out. So in this case, wild-type animals, maximum lifespan about 20 days, whereas if we attenuate uh, uh, insulin signaling more than 40 days, so more than twice the lifespan, Mean lifespan is defined as uh, the, the time interval it takes 50% uh, of the population to die out. So in this case, we draw a line from 50% uh, down here about 15 days, let's say. In this case, more uh, than 30 days. We can even combine uh, interventions. For example, we can impose dietary restriction. Dietary restriction is uh, um, a regime that can be used to extend lifespan in almost every organism where it has been applied, including primates. And there, there is also evidence, correlative evidence, that this is uh, uh, the case in humans as well. Now, dietary restriction, as you can see, extends lifespan even more. But if we combine these two, this is what we get. Maximum lifespan, more than 140 days for an organism that normally lives 20 days and a mean lifespan of more than 80 days for an organism that lives for a mean of about 15 days. So this is how much we can affect, we can alter the lifespan of this, of this simple animal. Just to give you a perspective, this would be equivalent to having uh, people living for 600 years mean lifespan, not maximum lifespan, mean lifespan. Now, of course, these experiments cannot be done in humans, but as I said, most of this uh, um, information, most of the data that we've uh, obtained are actually valid in mammals and even primates. Now, going to the original question of what are the molecular links between uh, neurodegeneration and aging, we can approach such questions in C. elegans by asking what are the molecular mechanisms that maintain mitochondrial homeostasis in neurons. I've shown you previously that uh, neurons rely on mitochondria, so it's to their best interest to maintain a functional mitochondrial population. And they do that very effectively because they survive for tens or more than 100 years. And we can then ask what uh, is happening so that this homeostasis collapses in the context of Alzheimer's disease, uh, for example. Now, I won't go into the details of how this is done technically in a model organism. We essentially conduct, uh, as they are called, genetic screenings, either forward or reverse genetic screenings, using mutagens or RNA interference technology. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that through such a, a, a scheme, we've recovered genes involved in a process called mitophagy. Now, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is a type of autophagy 
Now, autophagy is a self-catabolic process. It's coming actually from a Greek word, auto, phagy, which means eating. So self-eating, uh, cells uh, possess autophagic mechanisms to maintain homeostasis, among other things, also provide uh, nutrients for survival. In this case, autophagy is a process that uh, cannibalizes part of the cell whenever, for example, there is a lack of nutrients in the environment or when, whenever there is stress. Uh, how is this happening? There are different types of autophagy. I'm going to describe you the best characterized one, which is macroautophagy. It entails the formation of an autophagosome, is a, a, a vesicle that en encapsulates, engulfs, and, and uh, uh, encircles uh, the cargo that's to be degraded. And then this cargo is delivered in another organelle called the lysosome, which is essentially the sort of gut of the cell where this cargo is uh, degraded. Now, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is actually a type of autophagy specific for mitochondria. So in this case, we have a, a cargo-specific autophagy called mitophagy because the cargo is mitochondria. And uh, it was discovered in, uh, in yeast uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, mitophagy was characterized in yeast first. Now, uh, my, mitophagy is actually something that is happening also normally within us in our red blood cells. Uh, where there are no uh, mitochondria. You may know that red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They are enucleated cells. They also don't contain mitochondria, and the reason is it's because mitophagy takes out the mitochondria, eliminates mitochondria in red blood cells. Why is this happening? We have evolved to do that because we don't want mitochondria, which are consuming oxygen, in oxygen-carrying cells. Red blood cells will need to carry oxygen so they don't uh, we don't want them to consume the very cargo that they are uh, uh, going to, to transport. Also, they are short-lived cells. They are constantly turn over, turned over in our bodies. So that's why we don't need uh, mitochondria for their short lifespan. They have enough re energy already packed in or other mechanisms to provide them with uh, ATP. So very wisely, evolution, evolution has made it so that mitochondria are eliminated. And this is a physiological paradigm of mitophagy. Another paradigm that has to do with pathology and actually is more relevant to what I'm telling you today is mitophagy that happens when cells detect a, a damaged mitochondrion because cells should be able uh, to identify and take out damaged mitochondria. It's very important for them. And in this case, we have a pathway that becomes activated in the vicinity of the damaged mitochondrion and directs the formation of an autophagosome around the damaged mitochondrion for degradation. So it's a very clever system that actually avoids eliminating functional mitochondria, but sorts out and eliminates damaged mitochondria highly uh, selectively. Now, if this is not happening, if mitophagy cannot take out, cannot take care of damaged mitochondria, then we have uh, uh, animals and cells that experience oxidative stress. Now, why? Because damaged mitochondria accumulate, there's nothing to sort them out and eliminate them, which means that we have more ROS production, we have calcium leakage out of damaged mitochondria, collapse of the inner mitochondrial membrane potential, which is uh, used to produce ATP, and as a result, we have less ATP being produced. So all these factors culminate to animals experiencing oxidative stress. Now, of course, mitophagy becomes activated whenever uh, under physiological conditions uh, have uh, damaged mitochondria uh, accumulating, but at the same time, cells also need a way to produce fresh functioning mitochondria in order to be able to sustain their uh, survival. Now, in this case, there is another signaling process called uh, the retrograde response. It's a type of uh, mitochondria to nucleus, to, set to the cell nucleus communication, because most of the genes uh, that um, instruct the uh, uh, buildup of mitochondria actually reside, have migrated from mitochondria to the nucleus. So there is an orchestrated transcriptional response that activates these genes upon oxidative stress, so that fresh mitochondria can be built uh, in, 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 in the cell. So I'm going to uh, summarize and uh, close what I've told you uh, this morning. 
uh, what we now know is happening in neurons during aging is that we have accumulation of damaged mitochondria, but neurons actually possess an elaborate system that allows them to uh, locate, identify damaged mitochondria, and very effectively and, and efficiently eliminate them through a process of mitophagy. That is a specialized type of, of autophagy. If this happens, then we have long-term neuronal survival. However, if mitophagy fails, then we have neurodegeneration, as in the case of Alzheimer's disease. And failure of mitophagy is one of the pathogenesis mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease. This was actually first described in C. elegans and then found to be the case even by examining post-mortem brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. And uh, as a result, uh, it is very important to maintain proper autophagy in cells. And now that we know what are the molecular mechanisms responsible for this, we can even go in and intervene, develop new pharmaceuticals, new compounds that manipulate the levels of mitophagy with the aim to protect these neurons in the case, for example, of Alzheimer's uh, disease pathology. And uh, going back uh, to the original mechanism of aging, what we believe now is happening is that mitophagy and autophagy contribute to halt or uh, lower the rate of damage accumulation in cells because they are used as cleanup mechanisms, as homeostasis mechanisms uh, by cells that uh, eventually result in the elimination of damage and the maintenance of home homeostasis, long-term homeostasis, which of course can result in longevity, and this has been proven in uh, the case of model organisms. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. Again, as you see, we have physics, we have uh, medical doctors, we have Nobel laureate in medicine, we have Nobel laureate in chemistry, we have Nobel laureate in, uh, in medicine. So this is uh, SIPS bringing uh, together all fields of science, converging all fields of science that we use to have it in uh, diverging uh, paths. So, as part of this uh, very interesting presentation of Professor Tavenarakis, again, I thank you very much. It is one of the, uh, one of the areas that uh, has uh, made me think in a different presentation, probably next year I'm going to present, and you, you'll give me your impression. So, it is not scientific. It is based on, uh, on the sustainability framework. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you again.